Hello and welcome to the Signal Biz Hub broadcast. Uh, I believe we're on episode two already. Um, my name is Emma Selby. And I'm Louise Eldridge, and we're here today to talk everything small business, a real passion that we have at Signal. Yeah, we were talking, weren't we, Lou, just before we came on the show this morning to about like what is it really that makes us so excited to work in this industry with all these small business owners? It's an interesting question. And I think um, I think my answer is that small business owners tend to be so passionate and have such a sort of sense of purpose and the significance of what they do. It just makes them really, really interesting to work with and really uh, and really driven and also just the sheer diversity of the businesses that we work with is so interesting and I just love those people that decide to just throw it all up in the air and go it alone. I think you're quite right and I think it's that can-do attitude isn't it of the entrepreneur not getting stuck in a box thinking outside the box but the key word there that you say there Emma is alone and it can be very lonely running businesses as we know and, um, and that's what we're really all about at Signal is bringing small business communities together locally and further and further afield and just making them realize that you're not alone if you have a community that you can, you, you know, that you can rely on. And um, that's what we do at Signal is bring you together, create this lovely community and also give opportunities for different things that you can become involved in. I think um, it's, it's really good for businesses to join their local business community, whether that's networking or, or you know, a sort of co-working place like Signal. Um, but also, and one of the reasons we started this broadcast was so that we could talk to um, other influencers in the wider small business community, people who either run very interesting businesses, who've got a great story to tell, or people that have just done really significant things uh, for small business. And so by doing this uh, broadcast, we're hoping to bring yeah, more perspectives in so that small business owners that we know that are going to watch this uh, can feel less alone and know that there's other people out there working for them and you know, just doing great stuff in this sector. To be honest, you know what, Emma, you and I could just ramble on for hours about this, but I think what's really important, let's find out who we've got on today. Well, today uh, we have the most amazing woman coming to talk to us. Her name is Emma Jones, and I've known Emma for pretty much all of my uh, small business career, and she's just had she's just had such an incredible career in in this sector um that it's, it's quite hard actually to list everything that she's done in her introduction but she is the founder of enterprise nation and also just to pick another couple of um done a significant things that she's done from a very long list she's also co-founder of startup britain she launched pop-up britain she's been crown representative for smes to parliament um she was given an mbe for services to businesses in 2012 she was awarded the cbe in 2021. She really is an extraordinary lady. Um, Emma, come and join us. Thank you so much, ladies. You are like the female version of Anton Deck. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I you can't tell us oh, Emma. Often, it's... Emma. <laughs> It's so lovely to see you again, Emma. We haven't seen you for a while. I think we were we shared a lovely lunch some some about a year ago now, probably. Oh, so it's yeah. really, really lovely to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Lovely to be here. As I say, I've just I've never had such a wonderful introduction. And those flowers <laughs> in the background, I'm just like, this feels like oh, a the cherry blossom. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a positive picture, isn't it? Lovely. I love signal when the cherry blossom is out. It is. It's really lovely. Right. We've got a lot to get through and I'm timekeeping. So come on, Emma, we're going to pick your brains and find out everything as much as we can about you. Um, I just wanted to sort of reiterate that we're all really similar in that we really have a passion for everything to do with small enterprise. And I know that supporting micro business owners um, and smaller, small traders in particular um, has a special appeal to all of us. And I'd love you to sort of like take us back where that sort of passion came from. I, you know, in our research, I see that you started your first business um, in, in, in 2000, but I just like to hear from you, you know, take us back to that and what drives you and what motivates you in this very, very important subject. Yeah, well, it actually goes back further than that. So you're right, the first business was in 2000, which was at the height of the dot-com boom, which was an incredibly exciting time to start a business. But I think my entrepreneurial appetite started because of my mum, because I was brought up by a mum who ran restaurants. Wow. So my brother and I, pretty much for most of our childhood, we lived on top of a business. 
uh, you know, we would work in the business. So I think my brother from the age of 10 was waiting on tables. And so when you <laughs> grow up in that kind of environment, and I, I distinctly remember we would sit down at night and kind of go through the books with mum. I mean, that sounds like a really weird kind of upbringing, but what my brother and I had was always an understanding that if the business did well, we as kids would get that new pair of trainers or the holiday that we want to go on. So we just always, I guess, connected kind of hard graft and money coming in with, okay, then that means good indication for a business. And so I kind of knew nothing else apart from becoming your own business owner. So saying that though, I did get a job. So when I left university, I got a job with a big firm called Arthur Anderson, which at the time was a big professional services organization, worked for them for five years. And actually it's one piece of advice I always give to young entrepreneurs because so many people now beautifully are starting a business when they're super young, straight out of school, straight out of university. But one thing I do just kind of say is maybe just go and get some experience on somebody else's kind of training because Five years for me at Arthur Anderson gave me confidence. It taught me how to deal with clients. It gave me a great um, network of contacts. So when I left to start my first company, I kind of left with that foundation in place. So yeah, started that business, sold that business quite quickly. And then pretty much kind of the rest of the story is Enterprise Nation. So I've been working on this one for kind of 15 years plus. Wow. It is incredible how your, your youth can really give you your good foundation, doesn't it? So um, it's really, really key to tap back into that and not lose sight of that and keep yourself connected to the real you that started out so many years ago. It's the only thing that keeps you going. And I, this is why it was lovely hearing you both talk about your passion for small businesses is, you know, when times are tough and crikey, small businesses have had it so tough over the past couple of years, still now kind of facing challenges. I think the one thing that keeps a business owner rooted is just the constant reminder of why they've done what they've done. So why they love the thing that they've started the business that it's based on. And you just have to keep that love alive. That's some, literally when you wake up in the morning, that is the only thing to hang on to sometimes, isn't it? That sense of purpose, which I think perhaps is why all small business owners do have that really strong sense of purpose, because they didn't, they just wouldn't be able to carry on. So I think what we wanted to talk about today more specifically it was about how um, all of the changes in the digital landscape over the last a few years, certainly certainly since you started your first business in, in the year 2000, um, that extraordinary change that we've seen, how has it impacted the, uh, the, the kind of life cycle of the small business? It's been incredible and I was only talking about this on an interview last week actually because what I was saying is when I did start, so my first business was called techlocate.com I lived in Manchester at the time and I kind of find this embarrassing to admit, but I, I was still working at Arthur Anderson during the day, building the kind of the uh, dot com startup at nights and weekends, which, by the way, is another piece of advice we always give is start your business as a side hustle. And um, so I didn't have the budget to kind of buy a laptop to get started. So I would go to Manchester Library where you could get access to computer terminals, but you could only have it for an hour at a time. So I would do, I was doing all my research in the library. I would do, have my hour. I'd then go round queue again. And of course, anyone now would just be like, that is ridiculous. You can just start a business on your phone. So one way in which it's hugely changed and again and Emma you may remember this the first book I ever wrote which was at the beginning days of Enterprise Nation was called Spare Room Startup How to Start a Business from Home. Again rather embarrassingly if you look in there there's no mention in that book of Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn because they just didn't really exist they weren't in the lives of small business owners so of course the thing that these platforms have done is hugely enable entrepreneurship so everything from the trading platforms, Depop, Etsy, eBay, Amazon, hugely helped part-time entrepreneurs get started. Then, of course, the mighty kind of Facebooks, so kind of Meta, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, enabled all these businesses to now reach their customers. It's just kind of really opened up opportunities. And then in a slightly more kind of much more focused on Enterprise Nation perspective, what we're using technology to do is we've kind of spent six years investing in a smart platform that connects small businesses with support. And what we're really obsessed about at the moment is in a beautiful way, you've got lots of small businesses in the UK now. But what that also means is they are faced with a hugely fragmented market of business support. 
And what that, that can mean for the small business owner is the business owner is kind of like, crikey, I've got no idea which bit of the business needs help, who the best person is to help me do that, and what is going to be the impact of that support. So how we're trying to use technology now is to almost say, hey, business owner, tell us a little bit about yourselves and we'll tell you the type of support that we think is best for your business. So it's essentially how do we use technology to make the life of a small business owner more productive, where back to that passion piece, they can spend more time doing the thing they like to do in the business. Yeah. And someone else can advise them on, OK, as you're growing, now you need this bit of financial help. Here's the HR help you need. Here's a programme coming up that you can apply for. So I think technology has enabled entrepreneurship. But what we're trying to do now is how do we use technology to enable small businesses just to make smarter decisions? Can I just can I just jump in on that there? Because um Going back to what you said before, and I think we're all of an age that we we kind of were before the, the internet and we had dial up and it was all incredibly exciting. So, but when you were an, an, an entrepreneur in those times, you had to dig deep. As you say, you had to go to a library to research and queue again. How do we instill that, that sort of fight and drive in young entrepreneurs of today? Because it's quite, it's a lot easier. It's at your fingertips. It's a lot easier. So how do we balance that out and keep that drive and motivation going? So Lou, I think that's really interesting, but I'm not quite sure we have to. And, and I do think that's a really interesting question. And you're right that kind of a big thing that small business owners of a certain generation have is resilience, because as you say, they had to fight harder to kind of do what they've done. Similarly, business owners from the past couple of years have come out of it feeling mentally, financially, digitally stronger. So there's been that real strength and character building experience. But you know, for young entrepreneurs, I'm, I don't, they have very different skills, which in a way in the current environment are very well suited to what it is that they're looking to do. So they are brilliant at using technology. They are brilliant at self-promotion. And when it comes to resilience, of course, for young people, there's so much dialogue around mental health. Talk about one other difference that when I first, you know, so it's 20 years ago when I started Teclicate.com, no one would be asking me, how do you feel mentally as a founder? It just wasn't discussed. There was kind of not really much peer networking, you know, all concepts now of find your tribe, make sure that you've got like peer networks as you offer. Yeah. It wasn't really a thing kind of 20 years ago. So in a way, I think young entrepreneurs or young people have almost inherently got the skills that they need. What I think your question pertains to, which I think is really interesting, is do however they want to grow their business. So I think what we're coming into is almost a new definition of business growth because yeah. the young people are brilliant at starting. They're very entrepreneurial. They can hustle. Do they want to take on people and start managing payroll and become human management leaders? They actually don't. And therefore, what's really interesting is then when you look at the infrastructure, for instance, lots of government programs, you have to have five plus employees to be eligible. And yet so many small business owners say, well, I don't want to take on five yeah. employees, but I'll outsource, I'll subcontract. So they're not on my payroll, but I'll work with other people. So I think we are going into an interesting phase of what does small business growth and scale look like and mean to founders? And I think with this new young generation coming in, I think they're changing definitions. And I think they'll do things on their own terms, in their own way. And yeah. I think the rest of society will just have to adapt around them. Yeah, so we'll see, we'll see how it all plays out, won't we? I wonder, so that, I mean, that's one of the real trends, isn't it? That these sort of young um, businesses managed by very young people and, and maybe a horizontal sort of flattening of that business infrastructure where people are just resourcing across um, groups globally. I mean, so people, you can have a company where um, now going to tech, the technology that we have now, the board of the company can be in six different countries. It doesn't matter. So that's all very, very different. I think some of those hierarchical barriers that, or um, the structures that we were so used to are just, are just gone. So yeah. it's, I think it's exciting to see what happens. Um, one of the areas you wanted to talk about where perhaps things are not looking quite so exciting, or maybe they are, uh, is the high street because um, online, you know, did, did one of the huge impacts of digital is the uh, online retail sector, which obviously has absolutely flourished you know, 
wonderfully over particularly over lockdown really accelerated um, perhaps the decline of the high street um, and I know there are technological things that are happening that may start to bring the high street back in a slightly different way um, I know we were, were there with you at the opening of the um, the Oxford Oxford store I can't remember its name now it's completely gone out of my mind thank you Souk um, uh, yeah, so those those developments are really interesting where technology is starting to come back into the high street retail offering. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the future of the high street. Well, again, Emma, you know me well enough to know that uh, I only ever come back with optimistic responses, but I am hugely optimistic about the high street for a couple of reasons. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment around it's almost becoming cheaper to start a business in bricks and mortar than online. Because if you look, so many online businesses started during lockdown and it's become quite expensive for them to acquire customers through online advertising. And this is kind of coming out of the States first. And I, I'm such a sucker for whatever happens in the US. I always think happens here probably about two years later. And there was something came out last week of a brand in the US called Warby Parker, which has been predominantly online, fully online. Anyway, they've now taken the decision they want to open shops. And as I read all of the narrative around what they were saying, they were saying it is cheaper for us to set up a physical retail premises now than sell online. And of course, they're going to keep their online presence because I think the mix of both is ideal. And I think if you look at the UK and you mentioned Souk, I think small businesses are going to test the high street in much greater volumes because they will say, OK, I'm selling online, but it's becoming more expensive. Where actually can I get a pop up for three days a week just down at my local high street or indeed on Oxford Street? And operators like Souk enable that to happen. So this concept of adaptive retail, temporary retail, I think is really going to take off. And then there's been something that the government has done. So it was announced in the Queen's speech this week where landlords now, I mean, it's a little bit contentious, but if a property has been um, vacant for 12 months, the government is now saying you have to open this up to bids from small businesses or local community groups who want to use that shop. And there's been some people who've said it's not the right solution, but what it has done is started a discussion around Actually, if, because one of the key issues for small businesses is if they want physical retail, it's hard to identify who the landlord is. Then you've got to negotiate with the landlord to say, can I just come in on a temporary basis? So some element of the government forcing that to happen is quite a good thing. Plus, you've got more operators like Suit coming into the market who enable temporary retail. And I think we're just going to see lots more online sellers saying, I'm going to test it. Full-time retail won't be right for all of them, but it will be right for some of them. And I think they'll be the ones who say, let's take on the high street again, let's refashion it so it looks different. And then you have lots of different uses, part community space, part retail, part business support hub on the high street. So I do think these kind of uses will come into much more prevalence and hopefully brings that footfall back as well. Is there more of an element of collaboration happening, do you think, on the high street, as opposed to somebody taking a big space just for them? I mean, I know you, we've mentioned Souk a few times. There was a definite collaboration in that in that setup, wasn't there? And it's a really good question because Souk, so that's what Souk do. So they use the space for lots of different reasons. But also, if you think the organisations that have got multiple sites on the high streets, banks and telecoms companies, and if you speak to the likes of Vodafone and NatWest, they are all actively looking at what can be done in their spaces, because what doesn't happen anymore is if you have a bank branch, it's just not active enough during the day because just not enough people <laughs> need to walk into a bank. But you've got that beautiful space. So in theory, why not turn that into a small business showcase space where you're advertising your local business customers? You then do a retail pop up that enables them to showcase their wares. You offer some business support in it. So you're right. It's getting much more collaborative, mainly because space owners are saying we've got to give people more reasons to come into this space part entertainment, part purchasing, you know, that will never go, but we've just got to give people more reasons, otherwise they just won't come over the threshold. Yeah, just talk about that mixed space, just to bring it back to Borden, just very briefly, obviously the shed opened and it's an interesting, um, a very pioneering way of looking at what a new town centre might look like, because not only have they got the 16, um, they've got independent retail, a lot of independent street food, but they're in the same block as a theatre, 
which has weekly events. And um, also we've got, we're a signal opening a co-working space, small offices at the top on the mezzanine level as well. So you've got this real mix, you've got residential right outside. So I think that mix of kind of experiential retail, food, drink, entertainment, all at once is, is possible and, and work is, is a really good example of what might happen in the future. And as ever in Borden, you're ahead of the future because that's exactly what you're saying. I don't know if you saw this week, there was an announcement that IWG, formerly known as Regis, are opening their first co-working space in a Tesco supermarket. I did see that. And the founder of IWG, Mark Dixon, brilliant British entrepreneur, um, somebody said to him, and there was a funny picture that went with it of someone like working in the shopping aisle, which of course is not where it's going to be. It's going to be on a first floor. And what he was saying is someone said, this is ridiculous. Why are you putting co-working into a supermarket? And as he said, he said, you know, years ago, you'd never think you'd find a coffee shop or a cobbler's in the supermarket. Yeah. So it's yeah. just, as Lou said, everyone's just got to partner together because if you all want the same customer, why not all come together? Because you're all then giving that customer the reason to come to you. But yeah, what you've just said in Borden, Emma, is exactly, I think, where it's going. It's exciting times, of course, it's all tech enabled. Yeah. yeah, but it's also giving people, you know, setting when you when they do that, setting up a reason for people actually to a reason to come there, not a nice to have a reason to come there. So, again, probably the Tesco angle is, um, you know, they want people to come into the shop, not just do it online. So give a reason for people to come there and then they do other things whilst they're there. So, yeah, it's really interesting looking at how the high street is changing. Yeah, so I think well, I know time marches on and we had some sort of fun questions, didn't we, that we wanted to get in before oh, we, we did. <laughs> end of this lovely chat with Emma. So have, have we got, is there anything else we want to say on digital? Well, I just, before we jump onto the fun things, although all of this is fun, obviously, um, how can we help small business build their skills uh, for an online future like what can we do I mean we you know we signpost things at Signal obviously and we keep people abreast but physically what people can people or should people be doing to help upskill yeah well Lou for one thing you've just said the first thing which is signposting because there is so much available for small businesses and again sort of Emma knows this in terms of our history that we deliver lots of programs for the likes of Amazon Facebook Vodafone, which is all around free digital training for small businesses. There are many other organizations who do that. So there's so much online activity out there. So signposting businesses to that resource, I think, is really helpful. The other thing for small businesses that um, they are benefiting from is, is things like bringing in new talent to the business who's got digital expertise, but not at a huge cost to the business. So the Kickstart program where businesses could have young people come into the business um there's a, a program it's not run anymore and in fact we're contacting them to find out if they'll bring it back um a business called nominet ran some ran something called digital neighborhood where they actually got sort of digital grads and put them into small businesses to say small business owner you might need help scheduling your social media posts or looking at your website this digital grad wants experience can we connect yeah. the two of you and quite often for small businesses, it's purely about that point of connection where they need help. So small businesses have lots of needs. There is a lot of talent out there to help. It just goes back to this point before the business owner is so busy, they just can't actively go out and look for that. And I think organizations like Signal, that's the brilliant role that you play is you're literally providing the infrastructure of the physical space, but then it's how do we, or how do you provide that connectivity, which is just making businesses aware of all the opportunities open to them. Kickstart apprenticeships, um, help to grow digital program where small businesses can get 5,000 pounds to spend on digital software, Innovate UK cash grants. You know, there's lots available. It's just how can that be fed to the business owner in the most accessible way possible? Yeah. It's really key as well, as you know, we, we mentioned it a lot and it is what we do, so we would obviously mention it, is but having that supportive network of people around that you can actually lean on and say, I'm trying to do this and, you know, it's not quite working. Has anybody done it? And say, oh, yeah, I've done that. I can point you in that direction. And I think that's what community is all about, isn't it, in small business? And it's incredible. And, you know, we did a focus group in person this week. So we had six business owners who came together and it was actually for one of our sponsors who just kind of wanted to ask them how they were feeling, how they were growing. And it, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me. But of course, you bring together six business owners who are having very similar challenges. 
you know, one of them had put EU trade on pause. The other one was finding that the costs of importing from China were just too much because a shipping container prices tripled. Then a, a, a brilliant female entrepreneur was struggling with access to finance because she's having barriers when it comes to investment. And as they all spoke to each other, it was incredible. They came into the room as troubled business owners because they have yeah. all these questions going on in their head. They left the room like almost like <laughs> two foot higher because A, you realize you're not the only person having these issues. Yeah. And B, when you do speak to other people, you realise there's a solution for everything. So it is. And again, at Enterprise Nation, we've always been massive believers in there's two types of support that small businesses benefit from. One is definitely their peer group, because it's only in speaking to other people like you that you can get that confidence. But there is also that kind of expert advisor who we do think can help. So, yes, you want to kind of speak to everyone to say, how did you raise money and how was the investment process? But you also then want an accountant who can actually help you build the cash flow forecast. And I think if you can surround yourself with both of those types of support, that's kind of what builds the the best businesses. And, and as you say, it gives you confidence, doesn't it? It's, you can have insecurities that, that sort of come in, that imposter syndrome, isn't it? It's very common. You know, it's like building those securities and you get that from being part of a good community. Brilliant. Right, should we do some quick fire questions? Oh, you're going to love these, Emma. <laughs> They're really fine, don't worry. Not, nothing too personal. No, 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 don't worry, we'll be kind. <laughs> so I think I've got the first one we'd like to ask is, what is the best bit of business advice that you were given? Well, actually, it's related to everything that we've said in this session. So I think probably the best bit I've been given is base a business on doing what you love, yeah. uh, which, is, which is advice I've shared with everyone else who, who has ever yeah. come to me to kind of say, what shall I um, start a business on? So base a business on doing what you love, because then it never really feels like work. Perfect. Well, yes. so who true. wants to do work every day? <laughs> yes, it's not something you love. Uh, so my question to you is um are you an early bird or a night owl definitely an early bird okay definitely. and in fact i'm getting so old now the night owl doesn't even feature yeah no, <laughs> de- definitely and in fact it's this is the thing i know everyone has their kind of routines and rituals um since lockdown i um the first thing i do every morning is i send a note to all of the team so uh, i mean not on weekends so monday to friday uh, first thing I do when it kind of goes off to them about 6am each morning and uh, and then I have the most productive couple of hours of my day so yeah always early starter by six o'clock tonight I'll be done yeah, <laughs> yeah I have to say I'm, I'm completely with you on that you're more of a night owl Lou aren't you why these days so. well I don't know it depends it depends Depends what the offering is in the evening, to be fair. <laughs> Depends who's asking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what have we got next? Um, cat or dog is next on my list. Oh, such a tough one. So I don't have either. Um, I'm going to opt for dog. Dog, okay. They seem Lou's just got two puppies, so she's going to be happy. I have four cats, so you're on the Lou camp there. Uh, well, only because when I see, and I live in an area of London where there's a park, and I go into this park every day to see all these puppies at play. And the one thing I always think is, can anyone have a more loyal friend? And it's and it's also just, and sorry to always bring things back to business, it's one thing I really admire in people as a value when it comes to business is just loyalty and commitment and so I have to say I think dogs have got that over cats cats can be a little bit more sniffy and they're but independent self-starters <laughs> okay <laughs> so, <there> you go. <laughs> okay what's next Lou what's your next um, I've got one what's your favorite business app Oh, what's my favourite business app? Well, I should really say the Enterprise Nation app. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it would be Spotify because I am uh, passionate. Well, I just uh, uh, I'm back on the tube, of course, going back into the office quite a bit. And I listen to podcasts on the Spotify app. So I know it's yeah. not a businessy app, but it gives me that kind of business learning you know, when you're standing on the tube, you kind of can't read a book, you can't consume anything. So I think it would be Spotify. Brilliant. And I think finally, uh, what are you most looking forward to in the rest of this year, either professionally or personally? Yeah, it's always professionally for me. I know that sounds one track minded. Um, Yeah, just growing out this business um, and 
uh, hopefully managing it. We have a growing team and it's my greatest weakness is in terms of kind of hiring and managing people uh, just because the bit of the business that I love is business development. When it comes to operations and managing a team, it's I don't enjoy it, but of course you have to do it. So I think I am looking forward to business growth because that's the bit I love. Um, and then the bit that I'm just going to have to keep on learning about is then how I manage that and keep a lot of people happy, motivated and loyal, like lose puppies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, they're a, bit way, they're a bit wayward at the moment. They're not quite loyal yet. We're trying. <laughs> they need to be loyal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's oh. been so nice catching up with you, Emma. And I really, really hope that you're um, able to come and join us in Borden very, very soon. I'm hoping we can get you down at the end of June, perhaps. Um, but yes, it's been wonderful catching up with you here. And yes, it's such an easy way, isn't it, to get together and, and discuss the things that are close to all of our hearts. So thank you for your time and your uh, insight. And thank you for all your pioneering for small business. It's, it's really appreciated by all of us. Bless your heart. Absolutely. Well, lovely to be with you. And I cannot wait to get there in person. So I'm going to come and see those blossoms in real life. Ah, oh, lovely. <laughs> right. Well, we can't wait okay. to see you. Have a lovely right. and thank you very much. Out. Have a lovely time. <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, speak to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.